Okay, folks. Well, this is Marcus D again coming at you. And today we're going to be talking about session number six. Um, and I'm probably going to be dividing this into a part A and a part B also. And I'll tell you why as I get to the end of this. Um, but bottom line is there's a little too much information um, to do this justice in one video. And um, there's a specific reason why it'll make sense to have it in two parts. But um, the title of this is The Savior, all right? And we're going to talk about an elegantly simple but profound truth. We're going to talk about the key that unlocks that new reality that I now knew was coming, this new heaven, this new earth, and all the things we talked about in the previous um, videos, but um, specifically about the conditions that this creator God has put on us being able to access that new reality which for me, folks, I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss out on. So that's pretty much what we're going to talk about here now, because this God has also become the Savior. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, all right? And um, so to begin with, we want to review, I'd like to review some of the things that I've already mentioned, but that I learned um, once I understood that God had communicated with us, um, that he had shared with us in the scriptures, in the Bible, in his word to us. And um, so to begin with, what I want to do is review the fact that each of us uh, is not just this physical body, that we have a soul. It, as we said previously, it is the non-material part of us that is really the essence of who we are. It's the part of us, folks, that's immortal. Um, only these temporary bodies made of dust will die, but our souls will not. They will exist forever. And actually, um, in God's economy, as it were, the soul, um, the Bible tells us in God's eyes, one soul is worth more than this entire world. All right, so that's something interesting to talk about. Number two, this God is holy. That means he's perfect. He's far, far beyond and above us in all of his ways and all of the things that he does. He's also a completely different order of being. He's a spirit being. Um, but anyway, the fact is he, the Bible talks about him being holy, all right? Um, this new creation that he is um, preparing for us, the, the new cosmos, the new universe, the new heaven, the new earth, and that kingdom will be perfect also. And what he tells us is for us to gain entrance into that, we're going to have to be made perfect too, all right? However, um, we have a major problem, all right? We are not perfect, far from it. And the Bible tells us we are born into this world, every one of us, um, as um, a sinner. We have messed up. We've broken God's laws. We've broken those Ten Commandments. I remember when somebody first told me that, and part of me was like, well, I'm not that bad. I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> Um, but then I started thinking, people, Mark, have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah. Um, have you ever um, maybe um, stolen something, you know, especially when you're a kid or whatever? Um, you know, and there's a lot of different things, folks, um, that the scripture talks about, you know, selfishness, um, the pride of life, okay? Um, you know, a lot of different things. But the bottom line is God has put something in us, into our soul, um, we could almost, in our modern terminology, call it an app for the soul. It's called a conscience. And it inherently um, tells us, uh, or, or it gives us the ability to inherently or intuitively know what's right and what's wrong. We know um, that um, there are certain things that are and there are certain things that aren't, okay? So the fact of the matter is we come into this world and we are sinners. And then we, we, we start to accumulate sin. As a matter of fact, it's almost, folks, like um, we are each given a record, an account, all right? And I actually kind of drew a little ledger right here, okay? Mark's, Mark's, um, Mark's sin record. When I was born, all right, um, as soon as I was um, old enough to start being aware of certain things and sinning, um, there's actually a record with my name on it, folks. And every single sin I've ever done was being written down in the infinite mind of God. It's kind of sobering to think about. And what happens is all of this sin sticks to us. It sticks to our soul. We can't see it on the outside, but if we could really look and see our soul, um, it's all accumulating on there, and this is not good, all right? And so what's worse is the fact that the scripture says that the soul that sins, it shall die. 
Um, we die physically, and then what will happen, and this isn't very popular to talk about, but it's in the Bible, it's everywhere in the Bible, and it's something that um, uh, we need to know about, okay? Um, and it's, it's a place called hell. It was never designed for people, but it's a place of punishment. It's a place we want to avoid, all right, that we want to skip out on. Um, as a matter of fact, it was never meant for people. It was created originally um, for the angels that rebelled against God that we now know, the scripture tells us, um, that are known as the devil and his angels, all right, the demons that are out there. And um, so, but um, God's perfect character will not allow you know, sin to be just swept away. It has to be paid for one way or the other. The other thing that's sad about this, or in, in a sense is a concern, is the Bible also says we are helpless to do anything about it. We don't have the ability ourselves to remove that sin, all right? So if that was the end of the story, it would be kind of hopeless. But the good news is this God has also told us, the other side of the story, that he loves us so much that he doesn't want to lose us. He doesn't want us to have, uh, have us die still covered in our sins and be faced with that banishment in, in hell forever. Um, rather, he wants to be able to save us, to rescue us, all right, and allow us to be a part of that fabulous new reality that he's preparing. So, folks, he's done something quite amazing for us. Folks, even astounding. He has become the Savior, too. Why? Because we need to be forgiven, we need to be cleaned, and we need to be changed, um, into a comp that completely new and higher order of being um, so that uh, we are fit for that new kingdom. And again, the problem is we can't do it ourselves. He must do it for us because he's the only one that has the power to be able to do that. So who is this Savior? Well, he is actually a completely unique and historical person who lived and walked this earth about 2,000 years ago. His name, folks, is Jesus of Nazareth. Like the Bible, Jesus is another open secret. No doubt, the open secret. Why? Because most of us have heard of him, but far, far less really understand who he is and what he did for each and every one of us. I know I didn't for a long time. So let's take a moment and talk about Jesus, because the question, who is Jesus truly, is certainly the greatest question of all. To answer this question directly and simply, Jesus is the Son of God. He is the almighty, eternal God who became man and lived among us. Uh, growing up as a Roman Catholic background, I, uh, I knew about Jesus. I was taught he was the Son of God, um, but I was always intrigued by that. I didn't really fully understand why he had come, what he had done. I, I kind of did a little bit, but not fully, all right? Um, but I also realized that no one with any credibility ever claimed to be the Son of God. And if that was the case, then obviously he was completely unique. So I decided to study this too. And what I found out is there's a mountain of evidence proving that he is indeed who he claimed to be. All right. So just touching on a little bit of that now. First of all, there is more historical evidence validating that he's a real person who actually lived than any other event on the pa in the past, all right? And we're gonna talk just a little bit more about that later. Um, number two, he's also the greatest theme in the Bible. In fact, the scriptures contain over 300 prophecies written, um, uh, written hundreds and in some cases, thousands of years, even thousands of years before he was born, predicting specific aspects of his unique birth, life, and death, all of which were fulfilled exactly. Folks, if you know anything about probability and the odds, the odds of that happening is impossible. All right, there's something supernatural going on here. Yes, because we're dealing with the Almighty God. And based on the events of his life um, that are recorded, he, he was no doubt the greatest prophet teacher, and miracle worker who ever walked this earth. And yet he came to do something far, far greater. The Bible declares Jesus to be the Christ. That means the Messiah. That means the Savior of the world. He is the Savior. And he is the only one who was qualified to do this because the scripture also declare him to be Almighty God. 
the cosmic, what I like to call the cosmic Christ. What do I mean by that? He is actually the scripture. This is what's unique. You know, each of these aspects, the creator, the sustainer, the recreator, the savior, and the judge, he is actually every one of those. All right. So folks, why did he come to do something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves? Because we need to be forgiven, totally cleaned, and radically changed in order to get into this new reality. And, and as I said, he's the only one that can do it. So he came to die, to die in our place, to be crucified, all right, to die on a cross, to pay for our sins, to take them away, all right? Folks, he took all of our sins upon himself, each and every one of them, all of mine and all of yours, and he let the Father punish him for them instead of us. Folks, when I began to understand this, it's the most mind-blowing reality that I've ever been exposed to. It's the most mind-blowing reality in this reality, okay, that this Almighty God would do that for us, all right? And folks, let me just say this. It's not, it's not just the physical suffering and death that he endured, all right, as, as terrible as that was. Many people have experienced that, all right? It was something far worse and completely different. Folks, he actually suffered what has been called a hell death while he was alive on that cross. He paid for all of our sins for us so that we wouldn't have to. And folks, it was like he took my sin ledger and he took your sin ledger when, when he died on that cross and he stamped it paid in full. All right. And so now, um, and, he, and again, he did that for every single person that's ever lived, all right? How could he do that? How could one person do that? We have to remember, because he was in an infinite God. Um, he, he actually created the time and the space, and so he's, he's not confined by any of it, all right? Um, he, he was able, as it were, this infinite God was able to, to quote unquote, squish himself down inside of a human being. Um, he didn't have to squish himself down. He's outside of the confines of space that we experience. <laughs> Don't have to worry too much about that right now. The fact is he is able, he's God, all right? He still, he, he was and still is and ever will be the, an infinite God. Now listen to this, an infinite God dying for a very, very finite number of people. All the people that have lived on this planet seem like a lot to us, not to him. He's infinite, all right? And think about this, even in the human realm, the highest honors we confer among men is to those who give their lives for someone else, folks. So in order for us not to die, somebody else had, in order for us not to die, someone else had to die for us. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. The cross of Christ shows both God's extreme hatred of sin and yet his extreme love for us too. The cross of Christ has been considered the most sublime love letter ever written. How about that? And folks, the beautiful thing is that's not the end of the story. All right, lots of religious leaders have been killed, and if not, they have all eventually died anyway, for they were all human. But Jesus, three days later, rose from the dead, all right? He resurrected. No one has come out of the grave like he did, never to die again. All others are still dead, all right? We can find their tombs. Um, they're still in them, their bones or remains, all right? We know where, but we know where Jesus' tomb is also, but it is empty, and folks, Jesus' resurrection is the best proved fact in history. To deny it, we would have to become complete historical agnostics, meaning that we would have to deny the certainty of any other event in the past ever happened, all right? And, and that's just not being intellectually honest, all right? We know things in the past happened, and, and there, there's more evidence pr validating the fact that Jesus actually came out of the grave um, and, and never, never to die again than any other fact in history. And once again, that proves that he was indeed Almighty God. And in fact, folks, his life was so unique and significant that we actually date our calendars today by his birth. That's why it's 2020, and we use the, in, in, we say A.D. Um, that's Latin, the year of our Lord, Anno Domino, something like that. But anyway, it means the year, year of our Lord. Um, pronunciation isn't the best, all right? But because he was born 2,020 years ago in this year 2020 that we're in. It's why we have a year zero. 
Um, I actually did a, um, an audio on that a little while ago. If I can put the link in the description, I'll do that. But if not, you can find it on my website, markdemateo.com um, or thegreatquestionsgroup.org, okay? Get you, both both, both um, addresses get you there, all right? Um, so the bottom line is, folks, the gap between Jesus and all others is infinite. And all other, anybody that's ever walked this earth, any other religious leader, it's infinite. He is God. Everyone else, all of the rest of us are all mere people. He is truly in a class by himself. So what, should, what do we need to do about this? Again, something elegantly simple and yet profound reality, all right? We must realize we're lost. We're covered with our sin. We're helpless to do anything about it and in need of a savior, all right? <laughs> how can we not when we realize how really out of control we are in this life? We have a body that we can't even keep running, all right? Um, but what, what, what must we do? We must believe in him. We must believe that he's the son of God, that he came to this earth. Um, he's, he's, um, he died on that cross for us. He took our sins, died for us personally, and we must ask him to save us. All right, because he hears us, all right? And if we ask him, he's almighty God, he knows our thoughts, he will respond, all right? As a matter of fact, if this is resonating with you right now, you've never heard this before, you can ask him right now. Lord Jesus, I never knew you died for me. You know, again, I don't know what you did know and what you didn't know, but if you ask him as sincerely as you're able, you may have a bazillion questions. I sure did when I did this. This is what I did, but it just made sense to me. And it was, it was actually God speaking to my heart. And, and I asked him to save me. And I'll say this to you too, all right? There weren't fireworks that went off, no lightning bolts. I didn't turn backflips or anything like that. I wasn't even really sure I had done anything. But he did. He responded. He knows our thoughts, all right? And what happens when we trust him, all right? We are forgiven and washed clean of all of our sins at that moment, the Bible uses terms like we are saved. Actually, we're reborn. We're reborn into a new creature. And folks, the good news is from that moment on, when we die, we are guaranteed heaven, all right? Because it's what he did for us, all right? And then, um, then he gives us the power. He, his, he sends his spirit to live inside of us. Um, and, and little by little, he, he makes us um, uh, into new people, all right? All right, all those you know, those guidelines, those rules, those Ten Commandments, he gives us strength to start actually following those. It's pretty amazing. But it's the greatest reality. It's about a restored relationship with the living God. He is the key that unlocks that kingdom. And again, um, what happens if we don't? Uh, folks, we're still covered in our sin. When we die, we are going to face this God one of two ways. One, covered in Christ's holiness or righteousness, forgiven of our sins, or we're going to be covered in our own sin. And that is not good. As a matter of fact, that's what we're going to talk about in session seven. We're going to talk about the judge because we are going to face Jesus, all right, when we die, all right? But what I want to do here in part B is I'm actually going to take some verses um, that talk about this from the Bible, and I want to read them to you because the Bible also says that faith comes by hearing and hearing God's word. So I'm actually going to read you some verses that, that validate um, what I was just sharing with you, all right, that prove it, all right, that back it up, so to speak. And then for those of you that want to accept him as, as your savior, if you've never done that before, I will lead you through a simple prayer, all right, um, so that you can do that, just like I did, just like many, many other people have done it. It's not the exact words are not that important. It's the intent, um, and, and we'll go through that. So that's what we're going to do in part B, okay? So folks, in the meantime, um, I hope you'll reflect on some of these things. I hope it resonates with you, and I look forward to talking to you in part B of this session, okay? Take care. Bye-bye.